Hi. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Wednesday afternoon lecture series. My name is Idol Bekarov. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at NIMH, and uh, I'm a member of the FELCOM subcommittee, uh, WALL subcommittee. On behalf of FELCOM and the NIH fellows, we are delighted to welcome Dr. A. James Hudspeth to the NIH to be our WALL speaker. Dr. Hudspeth received training under Torsten Wiesel during his PhD and also received an MD from Harvard University. He started his academic career at the California Institute of Technology, where he rose to professor. From 1989 to 1992, he was professor and chairman of the Department of Cell Biology and Neuroscience at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. In 1993, he became Howard Hughes investigator. In 1995, he moved to Rockefeller University, where he is now director of the Kirby Center for Sensory Neuroscience and professor and head of the Laboratory of Sensory Neuroscience. In addition to the many awards Dr. Hudspeth has received, he has also served on numerous governmental policy boards, policy groups, and advisory boards. He has been on the editorial boards of most of the top neuroscience journals and was, and was one of the original founders of the journal Neuron in 1988. According to the National Institute on Deafness and Communication Disorders, about 30 million people in the United States have some degree of hearing impairment. Dr. Hudspeth's sem seminal work in this area has led to a greater understanding of the sensory receptors of the inner ear, the hair cells. His early studies demonstrated that mechanical stimuli of the inner hair cells activated cation, cation channels. Recently, he has elaborated a more cohesive model of the inner ear's active um, process, which depends on active hair bundle motility invi involving myosin-based adaptation motors. So without further ado, I'm very pleased and delighted to present Dr. Albert James Hudspeth and his talk entitled, Making an Effort um, making an effort to listen, mechanical amplification of myosin molecules and ion channels in hair cells of the inner ear. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Ital. Can you hear me all right? I've just been watching the fascinating things that I have allegedly not done or will not sell or what have you. I didn't realize any of this. So as Ital has said, I'll be discussing hearing today and uh, specifically focusing on the problem of transduction. How is it that sound, airborne pressure waves, get converted within the ear into electrical signals that the brain can then interpret? And I should perhaps begin by giving you some sense of the motivation for my work and that of other people in the field. There are really two broad classes of motivations that we have. The first one is a matter of curiosity about the basic scientific principles underlying auditory transduction and it's particularly fueled by the remarkable technical qualities of the ear, and I'll mention just three of those. First, we can hear sounds at frequencies as great as 20 kilohertz, 20,000 cycles a second. And that's remarkable by comparison with our other senses. As you know, if you see images at 20 or 30 frames a second, you see a continuous visual picture. That's the basis of television and motion pictures. Somehow, the auditory system can work fully a thousand times faster than that. A second remarkable feature is the sensitivity of the ear. At the threshold, the very faintest sounds you can hear correspond to vibrations within the ear of about one to three tenths of a nanometer, or one to three angstroms. So one wonders how something made of proteins and lipids can reliably detect vibrations that are of an atomic dimension. And the third feature that's remarkable is that we can accommodate sounds of a range of intensities from zero decibels to about 120 decibels. That's a million-fold range in the amplitude of stimulation or a trillion-fold range in the power of the stimulus. And that's a much broader range than any other sensory receptor or I think even any man-made receptor can readily accommodate. So we'd like to explain how these things come about. The other motivation, which is one that's very strongly represented on this campus, is a clinical one. As Ital has said, about 30 million Americans have functionally significant hearing problems that range all the way from a modest difficulty in understanding speech, say in a crowded room or over the telephone, through profound or total deafness, which affects about two million people. <clears throat> this deafness stems from five principal causes. First, there are a number of genetic conditions, at least 100 non-syndromic causes of hearing loss. 
There's secondly many kinds of infections, including encephalitis, rubella, and the like, that can damage the inner ear. Third, there are legitimate drugs, which have as their principal side effect devastation of the hearing organ. So this includes the aminoglycosides, like genomycin, neomycin, tobramycin, streptomycin, and it includes cisplatin, which is the major chemotherapeutic agent for ovarian cancer. The fourth cause is acoustic trauma, exposure to loud sound, which can be in a military or an industrial setting or just in day-to-day -day accidents. And finally, there's the phenomenon called presbyacusis, which means the hearing of old men. It's just the gradual deterioration of the hearing faculties that many of us in industrialized societies experience. And that's probably compounded of day-to-day -day noise exposure, but also of deterioration of the microvasculature. Just as atherogenesis affects the blood vessels of the heart and of the retina, it affects the vessels that go to the ear and cause the ear gradually to deteriorate. <clears throat> now, the impact of all this hearing loss is enormous. First, it can affect people of any age. It has a very strong effect on newborn children. And for years, many children were not recognized to be deaf until they got several years old or even got to be five and went to school, whereupon teachers would finally note the problem. It's now the law in most states that every child born in hospital be tested before leaving the hospital to assure that he or she has relatively normal hearing. And as a consequence, we are able to pick up many more kids and remediate their problems at an early stage. For the elderly in our population, hearing loss has long been a source of estrangement from friends and family in the workplace. It's a source of depression, even of suicide, that people gradually become less and less connected with those around them. And for people of the middle years of life, an acute hearing loss, which can occur to any of us tomorrow as a result, say, of an infection, that again can have devastating uh, psychological and psychiatric effects. Helen Keller said, Blindness deprives us of our contact with things, but deafness deprives us of our contact with people. And it turns out that the rather casual daily banter that we all engage in, for example, before this talk, is very important in sort of situating us in a social milieu and make us, making us feel uh, to be whom we are. And if one is deprived of that, the loneliness and isolation that one feels is hard for a hearing person to comprehend. Now, the remarkable fact is that the Great features of intact hearing and most of the auditory pathology that I've just described all stem from one type of cell, the hair cell, which is the sensory receptor of the internal ear. So we're interested in studying those cells both to understand how they work normally, but also with an eye towards understanding why they become so vulnerable, why they break down, whether they can be repaired, whether they can be replaced. And those are motives of many other people in this room who are doing research on related fields. So what I'll do in the presentation today is to briefly remind you of what your ears are doing right now uh, and briefly remind you of the structure of the cochlea, the hearing organ. This is stuff we've all had in the eighth grade, but some will have forgotten. I'll then quickly review a model of how hair cells carry out the transduction process. And I'll focus most of the talk on one feature of transduction, which is a really remarkable feature. That is, the ear is not just a passive detector. It has built into it sort of a biological hearing aid. It has built into it an amplifier that is constantly augmenting the sounds that we hear, making us more sensitive and more sharply tuned to specific frequencies. And this is a major uh, focus of research for ourselves and many others at present. So let me begin by reminding you of what your ear is doing right now. And this is a sonogram. Uh, at the top, you simply, whoops, sorry. At the top, you see a record showing I guess this one isn't working. You see a record showing what would come out of the microphone that I'm now wearing if you were to measure the electrical signals there. And you can see different syllables of human speech with different intensities and durations and whatnot. And in the sonograph below, that same information is portrayed as a function of frequency along the ordinate and of two and a half seconds of time along the abscissa. And you can see that human speech consists of different uh, speech sounds or phonemes some of which comprise three or more so-called formants, these relatively low frequency constant tones, and others of which are of higher frequencies and a more erratic character. This particular chunk of speech is the end of the Dylan Thomas poem, Fern Hill, which some of you will know. As I was young and easy in the mercy of his means, time held me green and dying, 
though I sang in my chains like the sea. In this particular piece is though I sang in my chains like the sea. And you can see that the vowel sounds, though, ains, e, and so on, are these low frequency formats. Whereas the consonants are represented by the high frequencies, sang, chains, c, and what have you. I show you this to remind you of the fact that your ears are doing this right now. And I'll use about 53,000 formants in this particular talk. So to understand everything, you've got to get them all right, and you get only one try. I mean, the remarkable fact is we're doing this all the time, all day. We're in real time parsing this rich uh, texture of phonemes and correctly interpreting them the great majority of the time. So the apparatus that does this is the cochlea. That's this coil snail-like apparatus whose name comes from the Greek kochlos, meaning snail. It's part of the labyrinth of the internal ear, which includes the three semicircular canals. They give us our sensitivity to angular and rotatory motions of the head and body. and includes also the utricle and the saccule, which give us our sensitivity to linear accelerations, including the acceleration due to gravity. One can conceptualize the operation of the cochlea by imagining that you could uncoil the snail into a straight tube, which would be about 30 millimeters in length. It has bony walls. It has two fluid-filled compartments that are filled with liquids, separated by an elastic partition called the cochlear partition or basilar membrane. Now, in the very simplest sort of model, you can imagine that sound transduction looks like this. When there's a compression outside the ear, that pushes against the eardrum, forcing it to your right and moving the three little bones, malleus, incus, and stapes, of the middle ear. The last of these, the stapes, exerts a piston-like motion, compressing the fluid in the upper compartment and pushing this cochlear partition down. And conversely, during a rarefaction, everything occurs in the opposite direction. Things move to the left, and the basilar membrane or cochlear partition is pulled up. So if you listen to a constant tone, a sinusoidal stimulus, everything would simply oscillate back and forth. And if this basilar membrane were homogeneous, it would bounce up and down just like the string on a guitar. Now, the reality is more complicated because this is not a homogeneous string. It's sort of a magic string that is broad and floppy at one end, but very taut and narrow at the other. And as a consequence of that, when you play different frequencies, they cause oscillations in different positions. So low frequencies cause motions of the basilar membrane near the apex, high frequencies here at the base, intermediate frequencies are represented in between with more or less a logarithmic mapping. The key point then is that this structure, the basilar membrane, acts as a real-time frequency analyzer. It breaks down a complex sound like my voice into the different sinusoidal components and represents each of those components in a distinct position. What's then necessary is some apparatus to detect those vibrations and report them to the brain. And that's the job, as we will see, of the sensory receptors. This is a, a perhaps excessively graphic demonstration uh, of the same point that I prepared in conjunction with Howard Hughes uh, Medical Institute a few years ago for their lectures. And it gives you a, a sense of what's going on. Here we see the uncoiled cochlea attached to the vestibular apparatus. And now you can see the representation of different frequencies at different positions. This gives me a chance to take a drink, but it also burns the image into your brains uh, pretty deeply. This is obviously a crude simulation, but it gets the point across. What I find most interesting about it is this is exactly what's going on in your cochlea as you listen to the Dakata and Fugue in D minor. You have exactly the same set of vibrations, the same complicated pattern, and the same parsing of the different frequencies into their respective positions along the basilar membrane. So we then need a mechanism for measuring those vibrations. That's the job of the hair cells. There are about 15 or 16,000 hair cells 
that occur four abreast in rows running along the entire length of the basilar membrane. When a particular portion of the membrane oscillates, as we see here, just the hair cells in that region are excited. And those excited cells are then connected to some 25,000 nerve fibers that carry information into the brain. So those cells that are excited the most will send the strongest volley of information down the associated nerves. The cells that are excited somewhat less will send smaller numbers of action potentials along their associated nerve fibers. The sensory receptors, the hair cells themselves, are not neurons. They don't have axons and dendrites. They're instead derived from the surface ectoderm. They're epithelial cells. They're columnar in shape, as you see here, typically flask shape or bottle-like. They don't have, uh, as I said, the, the uh, dendrites or axons, but they do make synapses onto afferent nerve fibers such as these that carry information into the brain. And the characteristic feature of a hair cell that gives it its name is the hair bundle, this little cluster of processes emanating from its top or apical surface. That's best seen in a scanning micrograph looking down on it from above. And you can see two characteristics of all hair bundles. First, the little processes that make up the bundle are of differing lengths. There's always a short side to the bundle, and then the processes get longer and longer as you move across. So every hair bundle looks somewhat like a hypodermic needle with this obliquely tapered top surface. And the other major point to point up is that the processes don't stand straight upright. They always heel over towards each other to form this conical or tent-like structure. And that raises the possibility that they interact with each other where they rub at their distal tips. If you cut across a hair bundle about halfway up, you characteristically see two other features. First, these processes sit in nice hexagonal arrays. And secondly, they're of two types. At the tall edge, there's a single process called the kinocilium, a name meaning a potentially mobile or active hair. It has an axoneme, a 9 plus 2 array of microtubules, just like the motile cilia of the bronchial epithelium of the sperm tail or what have you. All of these other processes are given the name stereocilia, which means a stiff or a rigid hair. And each of those consists of a fascicle of highly cross-linked actin filaments, which are covered by an outpouching of the surface membrane that fits over the actin cores just the same way that the fingers of a glove fit over your individual digits. These stereocilia are cylindrical along most of their length, but in the last micron or so, before they insert into the top of the cell, they taper, as you see here. And as a consequence of that, the number of actin microfilaments progressively decreases. So up here there might be 500 filaments, but most of them end on the surface membrane, and only a couple of dozen protrude into the top of the cell. And as a result of that, each of these stereocilia is most flexible or compliant here in its base. You can see that by taking a living hair bundle like this one, touching it with a glass rod, and you see what is shown on the right. First, the hair bundle moves as a unit. And that's in part because of filamentous connections among the stereocilia. And secondly, you can see that the individual stereocilia do not bow along their length. A stereocilium such as this one starts out straight, and after this motion, it's still quite straight. It's simply pivoting it around its basal insertion. Now, if the contiguous stereocilia are all pivoting at their bases, there must be a sliding or shearing motion between the adjacent stereocilia. And indeed, that seems to be the proximate stimulus that excites hair cells of all sorts. The stimulus is sensed by something called the tip link, which is this fine braided filament of two types of cadherin molecules, cadherin-23 and protocadherin-15, that stretches from the tip of each short stereocilium to the flank of the next taller stereocilium adjacent to it. The way we think the transduction work is schematized here the idea is that at rest, this link is relatively uh, slack, and the channel spends most of its time closed. But stimulation causes a shearing that puts more tension in the tip link. That pulls the channel open. Now ions, particularly potassium, can flow in and depolarize the cell. There are three things to say about this model. First, we have to reevaluate it in the light of recent experiments that suggest that the channel may be at this end rather than that end. But the fundamental transduction mechanism is unchanged by that observation. Secondly, this type of transduction mechanism is intrinsically very fast. There's no second messenger involved and no reason for any biochemical slowdown of the reaction. So it's probably the rapidity of this response that allows us to hear 20 kilohertz and bats and whales to hear 100 kilohertz or even more. 
And finally, there's no intrinsic threshold to the system. An arbitrarily small stimulus will produce some extra tension and some increase in the probability of channel opening. And that may well account for the fact that we can measure these atomic levels of stimulation. Now, given that transduction mechanism, I now want to approach the main problem that I'll be discussing, which is the active process of the cochlea. As I mentioned, this is a ubiquitous process. It's actually found in all the tetrapods, so amphibians, reptiles, birds, as well as in mammals. And it has four characteristics that are found in all those instances. The first and perhaps most important is amplification. This system enhances our hearing by more than 100 times. When in fact this apparatus is damaged, people become hard of hearing. They may still have an auditory capability, but they need artificial amplification with a hearing aid or the like in order to understand ordinary auditory stimuli. So this is a schematic plot of the frequency of stimulation and of the motion, in this case of the basilar membrane, the cochlear partition, uh, as a function of different frequencies. For each position along the basilar membrane, there is a particular frequency at which the response is greatest. And in an active cochlea, there's a sharply peaked response about that particular frequency. If, on the other hand, we cut off the energy supply to the cochlea, for example, by compressing the carotids or the like, one finds that there's a prompt diminution in the response to less than 1% of its original sensitivity. So the active process produces this large amplification. At the same time, a second quality is frequency tuning. Associated with this sharp amplification is a great narrowing of the responsiveness. So even if we turned up the sound much, more, uh, much stronger in a deafened cochlea or a damaged cochlea, we would find this broad frequency responsiveness, not the exquisitely sharp tuning that a normal ear has. The third characteristic is called compressive nonlinearity, and that's schematized as shown here. If we stimulate at frequencies away from the best frequency, we find that increasing the stimulus, say, tenfold in amplitude, produces a tenfold increase in the response. And doing it again, again produces a tenfold increase. Notice that this is a logarithmic scale. At the best frequency, though, the corresponding tenfold increase produces a much smaller response. And similarly, another increase of tenfold produces a smaller increment in the output. Now, this seems a little funny at first. Why would it be that at the optimal frequency, you have so much less sensitivity to turning up the sound? But I think the right way of viewing it is that even a very weak stimulus produces a near maximal response at this characteristic frequency. So if you increase the stimulus still more, there simply isn't more room to grow because the response is already fully amplified. The fourth characteristic is the most bizarre and the most striking. And also, it's the strongest evidence that the ear does contain an active process. And that's the phenomenon of spontaneous otoacoustic emissions. It's been found, again, in all the classes of tetrapods that many normal ears can produce sound continuously that's emitted into the surrounding environment. 85% of normal human ears in a suitably quiet environment will produce one or more tones coming out. The tones can be over the whole frequency range in which one hears. They may be widely associated. Some may be stronger than others. All types of patterns exist. Your left ear will be different from your right ear, but both patterns will tend to be stable over time. And my pattern will be different from yours or yours or yours. It's quite idiosyncratic. Now, nobody thinks it's particularly valuable to have sound coming out of your ear. Uh, this is an epiphenomenon. It's an indication of the fact that the active cochlea can become so strong in its amplification that it goes unstable. It's just like this public address system. If we were to turn this up too far, we would get howling from the feedback. And that's what's happening here. The active process amounts to positive feedback. It's enhancing its input. And if it becomes too strong in its activity, it will begin to howl and emit sounds. I should say there are occasional animals and even occasional people whose system gets stuck in that state. So the indoor world's record is held by a now deceased dog in Minnesota, which produced 60 decibel autoacoustic emissions. So that's as loud as my voice is uh, in this audience. And I got an email last year from a woman in Seattle who had a dog, both of whose ears were doing this, but they were out of tune. So she was suffering, the, she thought the dog might be suffering. Um, apparently people who have this continuous emission though don't much notice it because their central nervous system basically just tunes out the frequencies that are being continuously produced. So where does this activity come from? 
we're interested in one possibility, and I'll show you there may be more than one, which is the notion that the hair bundle itself, in addition to being an antenna for mechanical stimulation, is also the source of this amplification. So one indication of this is that the hair bundle is capable of active spontaneous motion, which could explain the spontaneous autoacoustic emissions. Here's a demonstration of it. This is one frame of a video showing the tops of two hair bundles here and here, these taken from the inner ear of the frog. To the left is the image that's got by subtracting this from a frame taken a 30th of a second earlier. And in that time interval, this hair bundle moved, but that one was stable. And in the next 30th of a second, this hair bundle flinched while the first one remained where it was. And you can actually see a snippet of this moving. You'll notice that this hair bundle moves relatively quickly and somewhat regularly. This hair bundle moves more slowly and more erratically. We can image this motion somewhat better by attaching a fine glass rod about 100 micrometers long to the tip of a hair bundle. We then magnify the image of that tip and cast it onto a photodiode with which we can measure motions smaller than one nanometer at frequencies of greater than one kilohertz. So as the hair bundle itself moves, it pushes and pulls the probe and we measure the movement of both. The other thing we can do is to move the base of the probe whereupon the hair bundle is pulled by the probe, in this case to your right. But because the probe is flexible, it's also bent in the opposite direction. And if we know its stiffness and how much it's bent, we can calculate the force that the hair bundle is producing. And we'll make use of that in a few moments. So if we attach a probe to a hair bundle and we provide no stimulus, we find that the hair bundle moves in a very erratic way, as you can see here. But as soon as we turn on a stimulus, and by turning on the stimulus, I mean we begin to move this base of the probe back and forth in a sinusoidal way, we find that the hair bundle latches onto that and begins to move in a nice one-to-one -one relation to the stimulus. Moreover, there's a sign of amplification. As you can see, this probe is moving at its base by plus or minus 10 nanometers. But at the same gain, the tip is moving by nearly plus or minus 20 nanometers. So there's an amplification of the input by a factor of two, a second criterion of the active process. There's frequency tuning. So if we display the results of stimulation at different frequencies, we'll find that there's one particular frequency at which the response is the strongest. This, as I said, is a low frequency receptor from the frog. So here it's around 10 hertz. And finally, there's compressive nonlinearity, the fourth quality of the active process. Now, the compressive nonlinearity is shown here in a somewhat complicated way. This is a log-log plot of the input, which is the movement of the base of the probe, and of the output, the movement of the tip. For very small stimuli, and remember this is one nanometer, so it's the size of a medium large single atom. In that range, the response is relatively noisy, but more or less linear, as shown by the green line. But over most of the range where we do our hearing, from a few nanometers to about 100 nanometers, the curves are relatively flat, and they have a slope of one third on a log-log plot. So this means that the response is growing as the one-third power of the input. And you'll see in a minute why I care about that. Another way of portraying it is to take the same data to divide the output by the input to get a measure of sensitivity. And the sensitivity is constant at low amplitudes, but then falls with a slope of minus two-thirds over most of the range in which we do our hearing. And the reason we're interested in these coefficients is they are often associated with a particular type of mathematical behavior something called the Hopf bifurcation. Now, a bifurcation, in the first instance, is a qualitative change in the operation of some dynamic system. I didn't bring anything with me that bifurcates, but basically, if you have something like uh, a piece of paper or my glasses case here, if I apply a force to it up to a certain point, it will simply bend elastically. But then there'll be a particular point at which the force becomes great enough that it buckles. That's a particular type of bifurcation. This is a somewhat more elaborate dynamic bifurcation, but the idea is the same. So the equation for Hopf bifurcation says that the displacement, which is represented here as z, the, the rate of change of the displacement is proportional to a real coefficient times z and an imaginary coefficient times z, and then this weird term at the end. And even though this looks a little funny, it actually turns out to be very simple to understand. You can understand it by looking at each piece separately. Consider just this first part, dz dt equals a constant times z. We know the solutions to that are exponential. 
if mu is negative, this fades away like radioactive decay. If mu is positive, it grows, unfortunately, like the national debt or population. If instead you have dz dt equals this imaginary coefficient, the solutions to that are sine waves and cosine waves. And if you put those two pieces together, you get simply the fact that the response will be a sine wave that's either damped down to zero or that blows up exponentially to infinity. If you now add this other term, all it does is keep this thing from going to infinity. It instead reaches a steady limit cycle oscillation, something like what happens during spontaneous emissions of sound from the ear. Now, the reason for introducing this is if we add to this a force, a sinusoidal input, we can actually solve the equation under some equation, under some circumstances. And we get the simple result that the response should be proportional to the force to the one-third power. Or the sensitivity, the response divided by the force, should be proportional to the force to the minus two-thirds power, exactly the relations that I showed you in our data. So this is strong, but maybe not overwhelming evidence that something like a Hopf bifurcation underlies the response of the preparation we're dealing with. Moreover, it isn't just our preparation that does this. These are data from another group, Mario Ruggiero's group, in a living mammalian preparation. This is a chinchilla. And in this cochlea, you can see over five orders of magnitude the same relation of input to output following this slope of minus two-thirds. So we think that this Hopf bifurcation is generic and that it underlies a lot of the hearing process, not just in lower animals, but also in mammals, including humans. So the next question is where it comes from. And we find that there's an instability in the cochlea, and particularly in the hair bundle, that may underlie the oscillations and the amplification. If we measure the relationship between the displacement of a hair bundle and the force that we have to apply, we get this strange curve with a kink in it. Now, first of all, what might you expect? If you simply take an elastic structure and push on it, you might expect it to follow Hooke's law. Right, the displacement is directly proportional to the force. That would be a straight line running through the origin. Instead, we have this peculiar region with actually a negative stiffness. And when we found this, we weren't exactly expecting it. We didn't know what negative stiffness even meant. So here's a schematic of what, in fact, is being portrayed. If the hair bundle is in its resting position, the fiber attached to it is quite straight. If we move the base of the fiber a long distance to the right, it will pull the hair bundle in the same direction, but the flexible fiber will then bend back to your left. That's not at all a surprise. The surprise comes if you give a small deflection to the base of the fiber. You now find that the hair bundle moves farther than you're asking it to move. The same thing happens if you try to move it in the negative direction. Again, the hair bundle goes farther than the base of the probe. It's as though I came up to this podium and pushed against it, and instead of pushing back, it pulled me farther in the same direction. It is as if the hair bundle has stored up in it the capacity to do work on the fiber that's applied to it. This nonlinearity turns out not only to have biophysical implications, but underlies a phenomenon known for some time, since 1714, in music. And I'll give you a demonstration of how profound this nonlinearity is. Giuseppe Tartini was the great violinist of his era. And while tuning his violin, he noticed that he could hear not just the tones he knew he was playing, but also some other so-called phantom tones that he was quite sure he wasn't playing. So he would play two frequencies at the same time, a higher one and a lower one. He could hear the original frequencies, but also he could hear F1 plus or minus F2, and he could hear twice F2 plus or minus F1, twice F1 plus or minus F2, and a whole panoply of other tones he was quite confident that he was not actually sounding on the violin. These come about, we believe, because of this nonlinear curve that I showed you before. In brief, that nonlinearity is the sum of a linear term, a quadratic term, and a cubic term. And each of these terms will produce a particular family of distortion products when two sine waves are played into it. Indeed, if we measure the activity of a single hair bundle, we find in addition to the frequencies that we apply, this range of nonlinear terms that you see here, which fit pretty well with the expectations of the model. So the demonstration I'll do uh, is shown here. I'll play a constant frequency F1, then play separately a frequency F2 that starts out high and then declines, and then play those same two tones together. 
And the idea is this. The most prominent of these tones, the distortion products, is twice F1 minus F2. So F1 is here, twice F1 is up there, and then twice F1 less F2 starts out a small difference and then grows progressively larger. So the difference tone starts out low and then rises. And the reason the demonstration is contrived this way is you'll hear a constant tone, you'll hear a descending tone, but if the demonstration works, you will hear also an ascending tone, which I promise you is not there. Here's the constant tone. Here's the descending tone. And now the same two tones simultaneously. Listen for something rising, particularly towards the end of the demonstration. Some people hear it, some people don't hear it. I see if I can go back. Will this thing let me go back? Yes, we'll try it one more time. Okay, that distortion product is strong enough, in fact, that some musical composers have actually used it in composition. So the late Karl Heinz Stockhausen, in addition to scoring things for helicopters and machine guns, uh, also has some pieces of music in which no instrument plays the melody. The instruments instead are playing some peculiar string of tones, but the melody is synthesized within the ear by these different tones, and you can actually hear it being played. So where does this nonlinearity come from? It actually stems from the transduction channels themselves, and that can be shown by taking a living hair bundle that's oscillating happily and then blocking the channels transiently by spraying onto them the drug gentamicin, which we know blocks those channels. While the drug is present, we find that the hair bundle follows Hooke's law. It's totally linear. But both before and after the treatment, the nonlinearity is present. How do the hair bundle's channels produce the nonlinearity? This is our hypothesis of it. The idea is that each of the channels is some sort of a protein with a gate that can swing open through some distance d, and it's attached to a spring. We think it's that tip link that I showed you earlier. So suppose that you've got three of these channels side by side, and we'll come to this in a moment. If you apply a mechanical force, F, to that ensemble of channels, each closed channel will feel one-third of the force. But if one channel now pops open, the associated spring relaxes. That relaxation means that the other two springs now bear more of the total force, and the amount is this amount KD divided by three. If a second channel now opens, the remaining closed channel bears still more force, and so on. So the system is unstable in the sense that if the force is low, all the channels are happy closed. If it's high, all the channels are happily open. But in between, there's sort of an avalanche phenomenon. As soon as a few channels open, then all the rest tend to open together. As soon as a few channels close, all the rest tend to close together. And that kind of instability can be harnessed to an energy source to produce an oscillator or to produce an amplifier such as that within the ear. Now, it's not at all obvious that all of these channels are really in parallel and working together. Force is applied to the canocilium at the tall edge of the hair bundle. So you might suppose that the force has to propagate across the hair bundle from the tall side to the short side. And this is shown schematically here. You might suppose if you pull on the tall stereocilium, you would stretch this tip link and excite these stereocilia, and then this would be propagated here, 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 and it would gradually diminish as you move across. I'm arguing instead that the stereocilia need to behave as if they were in parallel so that a force applied at one side is equally distributed over all of them. And we've tested that idea by asking how a hair bundle moves when it's stimulated, to Brownian mo stimulated by Brownian motion, that is, by thermal stimulation. If the stereocilia are independent of each other, that is, if they're in series, they should be able to move apart, as you sh see it in this diagram. If, on the other hand, they're somehow tightly stuck to each other, they should remain in parallel, and the bundle should move as a unit. And we tested this by using a laser interferometer, beaming two laser beams onto the tip of the stereocilium, and then analyzing the motion at a picometer level by each of these two beams. Here are actual records with both beams at the tall edge of the hair bundle. 
you can see the Brownian motion, the oscillations of the hair bundle, and you can see that these two records are almost identical to each other, as you'd expect, because they're both aimed at the same place. If you do an experiment with both beams in the same place and do a correlation, what's called a cross-correlation, between the two beams, you find that they have almost identical behavior to the correlation of, say, the red signal with itself. But now the revealing experiment is this one, in which one beam is moved to the opposite side of the hair bundle. And what we see is the correlation is still equally strong. So what this is saying is that the hair bundle always moves as a unit. We never see any separation between the stereocilia. The whole, the whole object is oscillating back and forth as though things were tightly held together. Just as a control, if we move the red beam, say, to the adjacent hair bundle, we now see no correlation at all between its behavior and that of the green beam. So we're now trying to work out what it is that holds the hair bundle together. Are they pushed together by curvature of the substrate on which they sit, something called the cuticular plate? Are they held together by strings, which are found at the base and sometimes at the tip of the stereocilia? Or are they pulled together by something like electrostatic interactions between the charged surfaces of the different stereocilia? Now, the other thing we need to understand the oscillation and the amplification is an energy source. I've mentioned already that an instability, if it's harnessed to an energy source, can amplify or can oscillate. So what is that energy source? And the evidence suggests that it's a myosin, specifically a myosin 1C molecule, myosin, of course, being the contractile protein found in our muscles and elsewhere. The evidence for this began with experiments such as this, in which a hair bundle was displaced with a constant force. The transduction channels open, we saw current flowing into the cell, but then most of the channels reclosed within a millisecond, and many more reclosed with a time constant <clears throat> of about 20 milliseconds. If we simultaneously measured the hair bundle's displacement, we saw that it also had two components of motion. First, it moved in the direction of the force and then jerked back in the opposite direction associated with this rapid reclosure. And secondly, it relaxed more slowly in association with a slow reclosure. Now, because the hair bundle is chock-a-block full of actin, and because myosins are the family of motor proteins that can walk up and down actin, we reasoned that it might be a myosin molecule that underlies this adaptation. So we used what we know about myosins to get at it. Myosins in general bind ATP and then stick to actin. The ATP is then cleaved to ADP and inorganic phosphate. And when the inorganic phosphate leaves, two things happen. First, the actomyosin becomes latched up in a tightly bound state. And secondly, there's an irreversible power stroke. That's when work is actually done by the myosin. Subsequently, ATP leaves, leaving actin and myosin locked in rigor, which is then relieved by the binding of ATP and then recycling of the myosin. Now, there are a number of events associated with this myosin activity that we reasoned we might be able to use as tests. For example, there are circumstances under which one can photolabel the relationship of myosin and actin. One expects that inorganic phosphate analogs, such as vanadate, beryllium fluoride, aluminum fluoride, and sulfate, would block this step, that ADP analogs would block this step, and that these steps would require calmodulin and calcium calmodulin, respectively. And all of those predictions have been borne out by subsequent experiments. I won't show you all of them, but just a couple of quick ones. Here's an experiment in which we give a mechanical stimulus to the hair bundle. Right after we break in with a pipette containing ATP, we see the transduction current and we see adaptation. And even 13 minutes later, that's still intact. But if we instead use a blocker of ADP metabolism, just after break-in, we see adaptation, but just a few seconds later, it's blocked. So a hydrolyzable nucleoside triphosphate is necessary to power this adaptation process. If we fill the cell with a calcium indicator, flow three, that measures the calcium entry into the cell, and then use laser scanning confocal microscopy to scan up and down one stereocilium, we find that when we displace the stereocilium with the stimulus, calcium enters at the tip of the stereocilium and then gradually diffuses down as a function of time. And you can see the calcium signal gets weaker as a result of adaptation. And if we quantitate the calcium signal at different positions, we find that it's in the range of a few micromolar, which is just the right sort of concentration to activate myosin, such as myosin 1C. And finally, the hair bundles indeed contain myosin, 
The dominant isoform is, has a mass of about 120 kilodaltons, and that was shown on this uh, immunoblot to be identical to adrenal myosin 1C. Immunofluorescence shows the myosin scattered throughout the hair bundle, but at least in our preparations, there's a concentration of the myosin 1C along the beveled top surface where we think that the adaptation machinery is housed. So our notion, sort of a working hypothesis, is that at the top of each tip link, there's a cluster of something like 50 of these myosin molecules, and that they're clamoring up and down the associated actin filaments. Here's a schematic in which we apply a mechanical force to the hair bundle. That force initially tens tenses the spring, but we think that this apparatus then slides down, reclosing the channel uh, and giving rise to the adaptation. If we instead move the hair bundle in the opposite direction to your left, the channel will initially have a slackened tip link, but now myosin cleaves ATP, climbs up, and restores tension. And at the end of the stimulus, there's now an excess of tension until the myosin can slide back down and adaptation occurs in the opposite direction. There's also this fast form of adaptation that takes place in just one millisecond or so, and its basis is less clear. What is known is that somehow calcium, which is this green dot, enters the transduction channel and binds to something associated with it. When it binds, the channel reshuts. That increases tension and pulls the hair bundle back to your left. This system is powered by the gradient of calcium running into the cell. Calcium has to be pumped back out. And there's a prodigious amount of calcium ATPase, this purple sphere here, which does that job, 2,000 copies per square micrometer over this surface. One possibility is that calcium, as it comes through the transduction channel, directly slams the gate, and that that then pulls the system back. Another possibility, though, is that calcium is interacting with the myosin. Perhaps when calcium comes in, it causes some of the myosins that are initially attached to detach. That allows the system to slip down and the gate to reclose. Or calcium might cause the myosin 1 to undergo a partial reverse power stroke, which it can do, again allowing slippage. Or possibly the necks, the so-called IQ domains, of the myosin relax when calcium is bound. In any event, somehow there's a rapid reclosure. And if one makes a model based upon that rapid reclosure, it recapitulates very nicely what we know about human hearing. So here's a model in which the green arrows represent sinusoidal stimulation to your right. The arrows here represent the sinusoidal component to your left. So in each cycle of this, the stimulus opens the channel, calcium comes in and binds, the binding recloses the channel, and that does a certain amount of work pushing the hair bundle back to the left and assisting the leftward portion of this stimulus. If you follow through the model, it turns out that a small force applied to the hair bundle produces a negligible response in the absence of the mechanism I just showed you. But if the calcium mechanism is turned on, you get great amplification. In fact, it's about 100-fold, as we observe for the cochlear amplifier. The system is sharply tuned to a very specific frequency. It shows compressive nonlinearity. So the gain or sensitivity is greatest for small stimuli, and as the stimulus gets larger and larger, the gain gets progressively weaker. And finally, it displays a Hopf bifurcation of the sort I mentioned before. For loci here in the left, the green area, the system is passive in the sense that if you stimulate it, it will amplify the response, but as soon as you turn off the stimulus, this dies back down to zero. But if instead the system crosses this bifurcation, it now goes unstable and begins to oscillate spontaneously, which we think can produce otoacoustic emissions. So what we believe is happening is that each of our hair cells is normally wandering around on this diagram. It lives in the green area if you're in a loud environment because it doesn't need amplification. But if you go into a quieter and quieter environment, it moves closer and closer to the bifurcation, producing stronger and stronger amplification. And then occasional cells blunder across the boundary to the unstable regime, and now sound begins to come out of the ear. So what I've said in the main part of the talk is that there's been a change in our perception of what the cochlea is doing over the last few years. It used to be thought that the passive properties of the basilar membrane dominated the cochlear processing. We are now quite sure there's an active process with an amplifier. We at least think that it operates near a Hopf bifurcation. And this active process tunes hearing more sharply and greatly accentuates the size of the motion. 
I've shown you the contribution of active hair bundle motility to this process. At least in lower animals, such as a frog or a chicken or a reptile, this seems to be the dominant mechanism. There's another mechanism called membrane-based electromotility in which the entire cell body of, of a hair cell contracts. That seems to be something uniquely found in the mammalian cochlea, and many people think that it underlies most of the amplification in our own ears. My prediction would be, and my expectation from our experiment so far, is that both processes are involved, but we and others are trying to figure out how the two fit together. The other point is that the hair bundle is not just a passive recipient of sound. The hair bundle is part and parcel of the active process that accounts for our sharply tuned hearing and the great sensitivity uh, of auditory responsiveness. Now, in the last few minutes, which will fit rather nicely, I have a coda to add to this, which discusses a, a, an effort to make do, uh, to, to deal with the problem that this hair bundle can be damaged. I mentioned at the outset that there are a lot of conditions that can destroy the hair cells of the ear. And when that happens, a person can become deafened. But in the last few decades, there's been a remarkable advance in the use of a cochlear prosthesis to replace the damaged ear and to restore hearing to people who had lost it. So I want to give you some notion about that. Here are healthy mammalian hair cells uh, in a normal configuration. Here's what happens when cells are damaged, for example, by loud noise or by exposure to some of the ototoxic drugs. And a cell like this will subsequently die. And these cells are not mitotically replaced in mammalian organs, at least not in the mammalian cochlea. There's a lot of research underway in a lot of laboratories now to find ways of replacing the cells. This is work from another group using the inner ear of the chicken. So here are normal hair bundles sticking up out of these cells towards you. Here's a region, basically a scar, that's got by exposing this animal to very loud noises. The hair cells there were devastated and totally degenerated, but as you can see, little hair bundles are now sprouting where those cells were destroyed, and those cells will later grow to normal size and reconnect to the auditory nerve. So there's real hope that if we can understand the mitogenic program that turns hair cell divisions on, that we'll be able to recapitulate the ear's development and eventually replace human hearing by replacing normal hair bundles. In the meantime, the cochlear prosthesis is providing a remarkable way of remediating hearing loss. So here's the idea of it. Remember, in the normal cochlea, we have the 15,000 hair cells. And wherever there's a vibration, the stimulated hair cells will respond and send information into the brain. Imagine now that you've lost all 15,000 hair cells. No amount of amplification by hearing aid is of any use at this point. But you could, in principle, and in fact in practice, apply some sort of a wire, an electrical stimulus, to specific nerve fibers or groups of nerve fibers. And when those are stimulated, the, the brain should get a sensation of hearing a sound that's not really being heard by the hair cells. So when this particular set of neurons is excited, the brain should hear whatever frequency those hair cells originally reported. This should represent a lower frequency. These should represent progressively higher frequencies. Such prostheses, as I said, have been in use now for more than 20 years. This is a relatively primitive version from some years ago. I'm showing it for two reasons. One is that this is not under patent protection, and nobody can accuse me of selling them. Um, but the other is that this shows rather nicely, in a very simple way, what the basic idea of the device is. It's a silastic plastic implant that's put into the lowest turn of the cochlea, and it has pairs of electrodes. Each of those is two metal electrodes connected to a bundle of wires that you see running here. And the idea is that this is surgically implanted in the cochlea. The 20 or so wires are let out to the surface, and then a person wears something, for example, on the frame of the eyeglasses, that picks up sound, breaks it into its frequency components, and these days magnetically broadcasts it through the skin to an antenna. The antenna then sends the information on down these wires to the respective electrodes. And the, this, <clears throat> the uh, effectiveness of this device is remarkable in the sense that we have only about 20 channels of information as opposed to the 1,600 uh, channels that we had originally or the 25,000 nerve fibers that we had in the original circumstance. I'm sorry, I said 1,600, 16,000 hair cells, 25,000 nerve fibers. So I want to play you a demonstration of a snippet of speech to show you how well your own brains can dig the signal out of a very, very noisy and distorted uh, auditory input. What I'm going to do is play 
a piece of speech in which I've thrown away, erased all of the information but five channels, five, five channels uh, of, of sound, I've thrown away every other frequency but that narrow group. This will be quite unintelligible to everybody. I'll then play 10 channels, and then finally 20 channels, which is similar to the number of channels in a, a current cochlear amplifier. And you'll be impressed, I think, with the fact that by the time you get to 20, you begin to actually understand part of the speech. So here we go. With the so that's pretty hopeless, but just five sets of frequencies. Now 10. Can some of you get some words? No? I get some pretty blank looks here. You look authentically puzzled. Okay. Let me play that one again, just to show you. So you're getting a little bit of it, right? A few words here and there. It's my voice, so you can understand some of the Texanisms. Here comes 20 channels, and you may understand a good deal more. The doctor of prosthesis is now in everyday use by nearly 100,000 people worldwide. Okay. Some, some people do seem to be getting You look authentically baffled. But let me play 20, 20 one more time, and then I'll show the you. The doctor of prosthesis is now in everyday use by nearly 100,000 people worldwide. Here's the original speech. The cochlear prosthesis is now in everyday use by nearly 100,000 people worldwide. Now, let me play the 20 again, and you will find that you can't not understand it. Just try not to understand this one. The cochlear prosthesis is now in everyday use by nearly 100,000 people worldwide. I mean, it's clear as a bell when you hear it. So people who get these devices, in many cases, basically get up off the operating table hearing again. And it's of, it's of enormous efficacy. It's now in everyday use by more than 100,000 people worldwide. It's by far the greatest triumph of neuroprosthetics. I mean, people are trying hard to find prosthetics for vision, for uh, recovery from spinal injuries, and so on. But this auditory prosthesis is really a, a, a now a very effective, very cost-effective functional device. So uh, I would like to leave you on this positive note that until we understand how to regenerate hair cells, all of us are potentially candidates for this way of remediating our hearing loss. So I thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Hudspeth, for a absolutely fascinating lecture. Um, we're going to open up for questions now, and there's two uh, microphones on either side of the aisles, if you can just line up with your questions. Thanks. And afterwards, there's a reception right outside Mazur at an auditorium. Thank you. Is the phenomenon of tinnitus related to the active process? And if so, uh, why is it stimulated by certain chemicals? Okay. Yeah. So the question is, is tinnitus, which is ringing of the ears, related to this active process? The answer is usually it is not. Now, there are occasional instances of what's called objective tinnitus. And it's objective in the sense that it can be measured externally. Uh, and as I mentioned, there are individuals whose amplifier is turned up so far and left on that they continuously beam sound out. And in some cases, they can hear that sound. But basically, they're sort of jamming their own radar. They don't hear those frequencies very well because the external inputs at those frequencies are blocked by this oscillation. Tinnitus comes from a lot of different causes. So you ask about the fact that it's sensitive to certain drugs. So not notoriously aspirin, which used to be taken a lot for arthritis at doses of more than four or five grams a day, that produces tinnitus. Quinine, antimalarials, and so on, that can produce tinnitus. We don't know well, well where that's coming from, though there's recent evidence that the salicylate-induced tinnitus is coming not from the hair cells, but from the ganglion cells, the neurons that innervate them. They seem to be sensitive to that drug and fire spontaneously as a result. Other forms of tinnitus, probably the most important uh, and common form, is likely to be analogous to the phenomenon of phantom limb pain. So if one suffers an amputation, a person may subsequently feel either discomfort in the missing limb 
or pain or burning sensations. And what's thought to be happening is because a deafferentation of the missing limb segment has caused a lack of information coming into the appropriate part of the somatosensory cortex. The, sens the sensitivity of the system becomes greater and greater until it begins to report things that are not there. We think the same thing happens in the auditory system. We tend to lose high frequencies first. As we lose the high frequencies, the appropriate uh, centers in the brainstem and in the auditory cortex are deprived of input, and they seem to become more sensitive, and then we begin to hear sounds, tinnitus, which are not really there. And commensurate with that, some of the drugs that suppress phantom limb pain, Neurontin and things of that sort, also have an effect on tinnitus. Yes? So is there a remedy? Actually, the same question, tinnitus. I have tinnitus, and I lost the high-frequency response. And so sometimes when I blow my nose, I suddenly stop it, but then it comes back. So is there a remedy or is there a solution that might come up from this electromechanical <laughs> transduction? Yeah. So uh, unfortunately, I, I don't think the answer is yes. I, uh, many of us experience that same thing, that often yawning or something of this sort can make can change the pressures in the eustachian tube, the pressures on the uh, eardrums. And somehow that shifts the range of hair cell operation. It can either induce sounds, sometimes one hears little ringing or pinging sounds, or as you say, it can sometimes suppress sounds that are present spontaneously. But in terms of a therapeutic modality, I'm afraid we don't have any answers yet. Yes? Um, you talked about the... Um the two potential mechanisms for active motility in the hair cells. And I just wondered, is that believed to um, apply to all the hair cells? Be because I, I thought I read something about um, just the outer hair cells and the inner hair cells were uh, just, uh, you know, sensation. It, yes. Is, does the inner hair cell also have motility? As far as we know, it does not. So what you read is exactly right. So first of all, this Electromotility phenomenon in which the whole cell body con contracts is nearly as we can tell is entirely unique to the mammalian outer hair cells. People have looked in other animals and found either that the Preston homologue is not there or at least that it's molecularly quite different. And when they try to measure a response to electrical stimulation, for example, in chicken hair cells, there's not one. So it seems to be entirely a mammalian invention. Preston is a membrane protein. It's a member of the anion transport family related to sulfate, formate, and other sorts of transporters. But it seems to have undergone specialized adaptation in mammals, and it's thought that it's basically a shed, at least as its dominant function, that transport role, and become mechanical uh, in the main. There are up to 10 million copies of it in the membrane, so obviously an enormous investment of biochemical energy in making this stuff. It must have a very profound role. But the main problem that we have not been able to overcome is the following. The membrane of an outer hair cell, like any other cell, has a time constant that's uh, owing to its membrane capacitance and its membrane resistance. That time constant is about one millisecond. So what this means is that stimuli at frequencies above about 160 hertz should be radically attenuated by the roll-off, the attenuation associated with the membrane time constant. So the question is, can electromotility work effectively at a kilohertz or 10 kilohertz or 100 kilohertz when it's limited by that? And people, including several people in the room here, are trying to find ways around that problem. There have been a number of, I think, very interesting suggestions, but so far no experimental demonstration of how to get around that barrier. So is there Preston in the inner hair cell? The Preston is, is not seen immunohistochemically in inner hair cells. Interestingly, though, if you make a Preston knockout, not only do the outer hair cells die, some of the inner hair cells die as well. And we don't understand why. So what are the uh, 3D dimensions of a uh, human cochlea? S say it again. What are 3D dimensions of a human cochlea? The, uh, the cochlea as a whole, including its bony shell, is about the same size as a chickpea, a garbanzo bean. It's eight or nine millimeters in diameter. The basilar membrane, when unrolled, is an average of about 33 millimeters in length, and there are typically three spiral turns to it. The basilar membrane itself tapers from the base, it's about 100 microns, and it, at the apex, about 500 microns. Yes? Hi. Uh, I wanted to thank you for one of the most remarkable lectures outside of my field that I've ever heard.
Uh, it was really incredibly clear and provocative and I'm sure memorable. But I have two sh quick questions. Sure. Uh, is the structure, does the structure of the cochlea function in some way to influence the resonance of the sound, much as the way a sea conch uh, does, or is it purely a protective device? And are there species in which uh, the hearing, the mechanism is actually linear and not wrapped up in a conch-like bone? So let me answer the other one. question. Let me answer one, one and then you can okay. ask the second one. So, so, so the answer to the last is, as you supposed, more primitive cochlea, say lizard cochlea and the like, are quite linear. They're even less than a millimeter long, a few millimeter long. Finally, in the chicken and the alligator, they become five millimeters long, but they remain quite straight. The mammalian cochlea is unique in having this highly coiled turn. And there are two speculations there. One is that if you have a 30 millimeter cochlea that wasn't coiled, it would stick the cerebellum, and that would be a problem. So it might just be an economy of, of, uh, of packaging. But there have also been speculations that low frequency hearing in particular may be enhanced by this coil structure, it's that there may actually be uh, reasons in terms of the propagation of information that this coil is useful. Is that one of the reasons why frequently uh, high frequency sounds are the first things that are lost as part of the aging process? So I, I think the main speculation there is simply that's wear and tear. The high frequencies are represented at the base, so all the sound input comes in there and those cells are stimulated all the time. But keep in mind, at the low frequency end, the hair bundles are moving back and forth as few as 20 cycles a second. At the high frequency end, it's 20,000 cycles per second. So there's simply an enormous mechanical abuse at that end. And uh, I, I suspect that those cells, which are also rather small, simply are vulnerable because of the strong mechanical stimulation. And I had another quick one. Is hyperacusis a central nervous system, a middle ear, or both? Uh, certainly a lot of it is central nervous, and this fits with the fact that hyperacusis often can be associated with anxiety and things of this sort, uh, and can be deadened down by taking appropriate drugs. Thank you. Okay, that's all the time we have for questions. There is a reception just outside Mazer Auditorium. Thank you. Thank you very much for your introduction.